Welcome to the Balkan Lecture Series, Episode 3. My name is Johannes Unterguckenberger, and the topic for this episode is Resources and Descriptors. Before we start, I am going to introduce this abstract depiction to indicate GPU activity, which I am going to use in this lecture episode and also in other episodes where we can see GPU memory, the level 2 cache, and several clusters of cores, each of them having a level 1 cache and multiple cores. Flashing of the cores indicates computing activity in the respective cluster. Whenever data from memory is requested, it needs to first go into the L2 cache, from where it is further sent to the L1 caches for processing in a cluster. From such a cluster, where shader programs are executed on multiple cores in parallel, it can also happen that data needs to be written back to memory, like for example storing something into an image. This can go back to L2 and is eventually stored in GPU memory. Okay, so for this episode's topic, we are first going to take a look at different resource types and then at descriptors. The specification says that there are two primary resource types in Vulkan, namely buffers and images. The Vulkan specification says precisely, Vulkan supports two primary resource types, buffers and images. Resources are views of memory with associated formatting and dimensionality. Buffers are essentially unformatted arrays of bytes, whereas images contain format information and can be multidimensional and may have associated metadata. Besides these primary resource types, it can be argued that there are two more resource types, namely samplers, which are used to sample from images at certain coordinates, producing interpolated color values according to the sampled image coordinates, and acceleration structures, which are used for real-time ray tracing. To make all these resources usable on the GPU, like in custom shader programs, so-called descriptors need to be created, which describe how to access a certain resource or where to find it in GPU memory. Not only does a descriptor tell where to find a resource, it also describes how a resource is accessed. That could be, for example, read-only access or also both load and store operations. Furthermore, some offsets can be specified, in some cases also some additional metadata like a certain image layout, for example, and in some cases also combinations of different resources can be described by only one descriptor, which is the case for so-called combined image samplers, which bundle an image with a sampler, where these two are intended to be used in conjunction. Let us now take a look at the different usage types of buffers. As a first usage type, it can be used as a so-called uniform buffer, meaning that it remains uniform during the execution of a command, like a draw call, for example. That means a buffer, which is stored somewhere in GPU memory, is loaded into L2 cache and further into an L1 cache and for usage during command execution. It can also be loaded into multiple L1 caches. If multiple clusters of course work on a command, which is not unusual at all, but rather the standard case. The point with uniform buffers is that they are read-only, where the term that the Vulkan specification uses in this case is load. That means uniform buffers can only be loaded, but not written to from shader programs. This allows the GPU to cache them efficiently, which might not always be as efficient for different usage types, namely storage buffers. In contrast to uniform buffers, storage buffers allow load and store operations, which also includes atomic operations which are handled by the L2 cache. Data can be loaded from GPU memory into multiple L1 caches, as we have seen before, but data can also be stored into storage buffers from shader programs executing in these core clusters, and the GPU must handle the store operation. Race conditions must be expected if multiple cores write to the same location in a storage buffer, which can be solved with atomic operations. But they typically incur performance penalties, at least in some cases. Uniform buffers and storage buffers can be used as so-called Texel buffers, which are a formatted view onto the original buffers. Formatted view means that, for example, if a buffer contains a bunch of float values, they can be, through using a Texel buffer, grouped into triples of float values so that one element of such a Texel buffer refers to three float values of the original buffer. Now we go a bit more into details. Where actually all the real data of a buffer is stored is a VK memory instance that is located somewhere in some memory region in a GPU. 
Different memory regions shall be indicated by the dashed lines within the memory block. Programmers have some control over the memory actually used if there are different types of memory supported by a physical device, and our VK memory instance just takes some amount of space in one specific memory region. What we also have to create is a VK buffer handle which is linked to the VK memory. These two have to be created for uniform buffers and storage buffers too. A textile buffer now adds a VK buffer view to it, which can be seen as a wrapper around VK buffer, providing metadata how to interpret the VK memory that is referred to by the VK buffer. And actually, all of these are stored somewhere in GPU memory. Just for VK memory, we can decide in which memory region it shall be allocated. And for the other objects, VK buffer and VK buffer view, we just use the Vulkan API and let the GPU store their data somewhere. The point is that the data stored with VK buffer or VK buffer view instances is pretty small, since it only contains some metadata, maybe some offsets, and most importantly, it is linked to a VK memory region, which can be really big depending on the data stored. In code, this looks like follows. First, in a VK buffer create info config struct, we specify the intended size of our buffer. But again, no big chunk of data is allocated with a VK buffer, just the size is stated. Then, all intended usage types are stated. In this case, it is uniform buffer and uniform textile buffer usage. Sharing mode exclusive means that the buffer is intended to be used with one Q family type only. And finally, the VK buffer function creates the VK buffer handle. The size that we have stated in the buffer's config struct uh, can contribute to dictate some memory requirements which we must retrieve. Based on them, we can populate a VK memory allocate info config struct instance with the required allocation size and select the right type of memory for our purpose. The VK allocate memory function then allocates a potentially big chunk of GPU memory. Furthermore, it is important to bind VK buffer and VK memory together, which can be achieved with the function VK bind buffer memory. So much for buffer creation. For textile buffer creation, there is one more step, namely the creation of a buffer view. In a VK buffer view create info config struct instance, we must establish the link to a specific VK buffer, set the desired format of the view, and we can set offsets and ranges into the referenced buffer. The VK create buffer view function finally creates the VK buffer view handle, which we can use as descriptor of type textile buffer, namely uniform textile buffer in our concrete example here. Back to the previous code snippet once again for creation of VK buffer and VK memory handles. We can, as I have mentioned earlier, just make use of these if we do not require the format conversion that the textile buffers perform. So let's remove the formatted from the slide. Furthermore, let's remove the textile from the descriptor type so that we get a suitable descriptor for just a plain uniform buffer. And let's remove one usage type from the VK buffer create info instance, namely the one that stated that this buffer is intended to be used as textile buffer, leaving only the usage as uniform buffer. So we can use this buffer here as raw uniform buffer, so to say, without any format conversions. Let's move on to further buffer usage, namely dynamic buffers, which are very similar to uniform buffers and storage buffers, just that they support additional dynamic offsets that can be dynamically changed. An application can change the offsets dynamically, dynamically during runtime without paying the overhead of creating entirely new buffer objects or handling the offsets by different, probably more complicated ways, like manually keeping track of offsets. Note that it is totally an option to have multiple VK buffer instances bound to the same VK memory region. Different or also dynamic offsets can be used to refer to different regions within the GPU memory represented by a VK memory instance. And finally, we have the inline uniform block, which is just a very small piece of data, so that it can be stored inline in command buffers. It acts like a uniform buffer, 
but is not linked to a VK memory instance and contains its data in line. That also means that such a buffer is very restricted in terms of its size. Let us now move on to images and their different usage types. The first usage type is as storage image. As you might have guessed from its name, it supports load and store operations and with that also atomic operations. In this regard, it is very similar to storage buffers. That means data can be loaded by multiple core clusters and also multiple core clusters can store to the image. If all of them store to a different location, no extra synchronization must be utilized. Here on the slide we have an example image with extends 16 by 9 pixels and the storage image is accessed through its pixel coordinates. That means that the marked pixel can be accessed through xy integer coordinates 2 and 2. A sampled image is a different usage type of images. It provides sampled load operations from an image. That means store operations are not supported, only load operations, just like with uniform buffers in that regard. In contrast to storage images, sampled images are not accessed through their exact pixel coordinates, but instead through normalized coordinates where all coordinate axes are normalized to a range of 0 to 1. The same pixel as on the previous slide, or more precisely the center of that pixel, can be accessed at coordinates 0 0.15625 and 0 0.2 periodic 7 for the x and y coordinates. And accessing this sampled image at coordinates 0 0.5, 0 0.5 means that the image is sampled in such a way that relevant neighboring pixel values are loaded and interpolated according to the requested sampling coordinates. The third usage type of an image can be as an input attachment, which means load only access within a render pass. The access to an input attachment is frame buffer local, which means that only one single pixel can be accessed, but not the neighboring ones. In contrast to buffers, which can be used without a VK buffer view for many purposes, images are used almost always through an image view. Let's take a quick look at the code, which is pretty similar to what we have had with buffers. First, we populate a VK image create info config struct instance, as we have seen it exemplarily during episode one of this lecture series. And we also specify the size of the image there and create a VK image handle. We use the created VK image handle to query memory requirements. And based on them, we allocate memory on the GPU. Also in this case, we have to bind image and memory together. And we do that by using the VK bind image memory function. What is still missing is the image view wrapper around a VK image instance that can be cre created using a VK image view create info config struct instance as it is highlighted on the slide. We can see that a reference to a concrete VK image must be established. The type of the view is set to 2D and the format is specified which does not have to match the VK images format but can be a different one which can be used for format conversions. Also the components of the original image can be remapped with an image view like in this example here by changing the order of the color components from RGB to BGR. Note however that this Swiss link can only be used in certain situations which the specification describes as follows. This remapping must be the identity swizzle for storage image descriptors, input attachment descriptors, frame buffer attachments and any VK image view used with a combined image sampler that enables sampler Y CBCR conversion. Further parameters include the specification of a sub-resource range, which means that the image view could only refer to a part of the image or to only one layer of an image if it contained multiple of them. The VK image view handle is finally created with the VK create image view function and in most places you will find yourself passing around VK image view handles, not VK image handles directly. So we have seen how to create different resources in GPU memory, where some of them require separate VK memory allocations, typically those which can become rather big, such as buffers and images. Images almost always require a view, where it is typically not required for buffers unless format conversions are desired. Smaller resources in terms of memory usage, like samplers and also buffers that come in the form of inline uniform blocks, 
do not require separate memory allocations. And as far as acceleration structures are concerned, they actually can become pretty big in terms of memory consumption and a slightly different approach is taken for them. The VK acceleration structure KHR by itself contains only metadata, meaning that it has low memory requirements. So where exactly that is put into GPU memory is handled by the graphics card. And for the big chunk of memory that contains all the geometry, a separate buffer has to be provided and referenced. And for that buffer, the programmer can decide in which memory region to allocate the associated VK memory. Back to our overview and moving on to the second part of this episode, let us talk about descriptors, which actually describe how resources can be accessed, for example, in our custom shader programs. First of all, one descriptor describes exactly one resource. Descriptors are not bound individually, but they are always organized in so-called descriptor sets. That means descriptors can and should be arranged in a meaningful or useful manner by the programmer. For example, it would make sense to put descriptors into a common set which refer to resources which are always used in conjunction. The point here is that this organization into descriptor sets shall reduce the overhead of constant fine-grained descriptor changes so that the programmer shall think of an optimal binding strategy which incurs as few changes and rebinds as possible. Multiple of such descriptor sets can be used and it also is perfectly fine to have only one descriptor in a set um, if no useful grouping could have been found otherwise. When we talk about binding descriptors, we must also talk about command buffers, because all descriptor state is tracked only inside command buffers. That means descriptor sets are always bound at command buffer level. Their state is local to command buffers. Descriptors are not bound at queue level or even globally, it is within the bounds of a command buffer. So a command buffer contains one or multiple commands that are to be executed on the GPU and not the separate commands are submitted to queues for processing, but it is always a command buffer which, which is submitted. So let's take a look at an example. Let's say this command buffer contains one command. This could be a draw call, for example, or some compute workload. And let's assume that this command, command one, requires resources uh, that we have put into two different descriptor sets. And the descriptor that we would like to bind to set at index zero are contained within descriptor set A. And the descriptors to be bound to the set at index one are contained within descriptor set B. Within this command buffer, descriptor set A remains bound to set index zero and descriptor set B remains bound to set index one, as long as we do not change these bindings. Let us add another command, namely command two. And let us assume that command 2 can make use of the descriptors in descriptor set A, so no new set has to be bound to set index 0 within this command buffer for command 2, which is recorded after command 1. However, the descriptor set bound to set index 1 was not suitable for command 2, so a different descriptor set was bound before recording command 2 at set index 1, and an additional descriptor set was bound to set index 2, which was not used by command 1 at all. And we had another command, namely command 3. It could be the case that command 3 can reuse everything that was bound before recording command 2, so no overhead of binding different descriptor sets or rebinding them must be paid in such a case. Let us add one more command to this command buffer, which we call command 4. And in this example, descriptor sets A and C could remain bound to indices 0 and 1, respectively, but yet another descriptor set E was bound to set index 2 for the purposes of command 4. The pattern that you see here on the slide has um, not emerged by coincidence, by the way, because those sets with the highest rate of change in terms of descriptor set bindings shall be those with the highest set IDs, while those descriptor sets which never or rarely change shall be put at lower set IDs. Uh, let's just look briefly into some of the descriptor sets here uh, and see what, um, what could exemplarily be contained within them. In this example, descriptor set A contains one descriptor for a storage image, 50 sampled image descriptors and two sampler descriptors. Descriptor set B contains one uniform buffer descriptor and then another three uniform buffer descriptors stated as an array of uniform buffers, 
bound to a different binding ID. And the scriptor set C contains one uniform buffer descriptor and an array of three storage buffer descriptors and one acceleration structure descriptor. Once the command buffer has been completely recorded with the proper descriptor sets bound before recording the commands, this work package is submitted to a queue in order for being processed by the GPU. The GPU compiles the information and the descriptor references stated within the command buffer. It schedules the beginning of processing of the commands in submission order. And based on the information provided inside the command buffers, the GPU can establish all the relevant resource binding through the stated descriptors. And with that, commands have access to all resources that they need and they can start being processed. This slide shows one of the previous slides uh, with information about descriptors and descriptor sets extended by the inf important information that descriptor state is tracked at command buffer level. There is one more important aspect of binding descriptor sets with within command buffers, namely the pipeline bind point, which there are multiple of. Most importantly, there are different bind points for graphics commands, for compute commands and for ray tracing commands. Binding descriptors to one bind point does not disturb the others, which is described like follows in the specification. Pipeline bind point is a VK pipeline bind point indicating the type of the pipeline that will use the descriptors. There is a separate set of bind points for each pipeline type, so binding one does not disturb the others. One can imagine this almost like parallel universes in terms of descriptor set bindings within a command buffer, where there are different descriptor set bindings handled side by side without interfering the bindings at the other pipeline bind points. So if we assume that the green descriptor sets are bound to the ray tracing bind point and command one is a ray tracing command, it just takes the currently bound descriptors from the ray tracing bind point. And if you further assume that command 2 is a graphics command, like a draw call, that takes the currently bound descriptor sets from the graphics bind point. The two do not interfere with each other. But let's go back to a more focused view with one bind point only. And let us turn our attention to the GPU memory allocation once again. The question here is, um, how is the storage for the descriptor set information being allocated? And the answer is that it is partially handled by the GPU, but does not work totally automatically. So, the descriptor sets are allocated from a pool, and the GPU manages in an opaque way in which memory region it puts them, and the descriptors reference other resources in possibly different memory regions within the GPU memory. The process of allocating descriptor sets is described on this slide. First, a sufficiently large pool must be created, then a descriptor set layout must be assembled, which eventually determines the required allocation size when allocating a descriptor set from the pool, and with the descriptor set layout, a new set can be allocated from the pool, yielding a VK descriptor set handle. That VK descriptor set handle is already the handle which can be used to bind a certain descriptor set to a given descriptor set index within a command buffer. But attention, only allocating a descriptor set is not sufficient because so far only the descriptor set memory has been allocated, it does not contain any data yet. The allocated descriptor set must be populated with the information about which resource it actually refers to. And that can be achieved with a call to VK update descriptor sets, passing as many VK write descriptor set entries, which there are resource binding within that descriptor set. Please use the information given on this slide to set the appropriate data within these VK write descriptor set elements according to the specific descriptor types you are going to use in your application. Different parameters must be specified for buffers, images, samplers, acceleration structures, and different usages of them. Lastly, I'd like to show how to establish the connection into GLSL shaders for each descriptor type. We start with an example for sampler and sampled image descriptors, which are passed as separate objects. 
This is in contrast to the combined image sampler, where the information of a specific sampler and the sampled image are combined into a single common descriptor. In GLSL, the explicit creation of a sampler 2D can be omitted with such a combined image sampler descriptor. A storage image is declared differently than sampled images and can be used with image load and image store functions. Uniform textile buffers are declared as sampler buffers and can be accessed by functions such as textile fetch. Storage textile buffers are declared as image buffers and can be accessed with image load and image store functions similarly to storage images. Different types of uniform buffers, or also inline uniform blocks, can be declared and used in GLSL shaders as shown here. Storage buffers are declared with the buffer qualifier in contrast to the uniform qualifier in the previous example. The example code shows a part of a particle simulation or animation code. And on this slide, that code is extended a bit to make the point that storage buffers can also be written to, as shown in the last line of the code snippet, where updated particle positions are stored back into the storage buffer. Input attachments can be accessed as shown here. And finally, the last example shows how to access acceleration structures once with a ray tracing pipeline using the trace ray X function and the second time through a ray query, which can be used from within any shader type. This concludes the third episode in our Vulkan lecture series. I wish you the best of luck with successfully binding descriptors for usage in your custom shaders. And whenever something does not seem to work or whenever things go wrong, make sure to have the standard validation layer, the VK layer Kronos validation that we have seen during episode one, active and check its error messages or warnings. They are usually very helpful in these situations. Thank you very much for your attention.